Hi, this is Greg from Structural Toolkit, and in this video we're going to go through how to design a cantilever masonry wall and footing. Using Toolkit, we can design a masonry wall and footing for various loading scenarios. For this video, we'll go through and design a reinforced freestanding cantilever wall for overturning due to wind action. To do this, we'll need to use the wind loads, hoardings, masonry member and eccentric pad design modules. Using the wind loads module, we can calculate our design ultimate wind pressure and then our shape factor with the hoardings module. The masonry member design can then be used to check the reinforced bending capacity of our wall under our calculated wind loads. And finally, the eccentric pad design can check the overturning capacity and bearing limits of our wall's footing. As we went through the wind loads module in another video, we'll just cover the masonry and footing side of the design. For our example, we will design a 2.4 meter high from the top of the footing and 10 meter long reinforced double grip wall that is 300 millimeters thick. To better showcase how the eccentric pad module works, we'll say that this wall is on a site boundary and so we can only extend the footing width in one direction. We'll say our saw report has specified the footing needs to be founded down to 500 millimeters depth and we will work out how wide it needs to be later. At this depth, we will then have a bearing capacity of 150 kPa. As for the wind force supplied on the wall, we'll assume we've used the wind loads module and arrived at a design ultimate wind pressure of 0.68 kPa without any wind coefficient supplied yet. So the first thing we need to design is our masonry wall. So we'll open up the masonry member module. This module is split into a number of tabs. The second tab, being the Properties tab, allows us to select the kind of block or brick we are going to use, specify joint thickness and raking, grout properties, and then reinforcement. As a default, we are currently using a block wall, so we'll need to press the Select button to change it to our clay bricks. For our wall, we'll pick the Victorian pressed brick has a characteristic compression strength of 25 MPa. Note that the type of bricks will depend on your location. Next we will want to then set the number of leaves to be 2, as we are going to be using a double brick wall. To get our wall width to 300, we'll want to specify a cavity width of 80mm. As we are going to reinforce our wall, we will need to include grout. And the easiest way to do this is to press the grouted button on the side. This will fill in the grouted section, specifically placing a 1 in the grouted every cell, indicating that grout will be continuously used throughout the cavity. If using block walls, you can use this input to specify grout to every certain number of cores to correspond with reinforcement if you'd like. Next, we'll want to press the reinforce button to input some default reinforcement below. This will also automatically calculate our depth to steel, which will be central in the wall. For our vertical reinforcement, we'll specify in 12 bars at 600 centers to begin with. We will get an error at the top to do with ductility for earthquake. We can turn this off by setting the ductility check to no on the reinforced bending tab. Whether or not you actually need to look at this will depend on the kind of design you're doing. That covers everything we need to do in the properties tab. So we'll now move on to the geometry tab to check the robustness of our wall. As our wall is only going to be fixed into the footing, we'll need to specify free restraints to the top and sides and then rotational to the bottom. We'll then put in our height of 2.4 meters and leave our length as 10 meters. These inputs will affect the robustness check done below and as we can see that we've specified our wall as a cantilever, the formula in the brackets is that of WL squared on 2 when dealing with the minimum 0.5 kPa out of plane load for robustness. For other cases of edge restraint, the moments are derived by statics where suitable, as well as the AS3600 concrete two-way slab philosophy. You can override the automatically calculated robustness moments using the manual inputs should you require this. If there are going to be problems with robustness, you will get some warnings at the top stating so. So in our case, we can just move on as they are just the errors we saw previously and we will deal with shortly. The next tab on the bottom is the fire tab, where we could check the fire resistance period if needed. After that, there are then two kinds of compression, bending and shear design. 
The first three refer to an unreinforced wall and so don't apply in our case. The last three are then for a reinforced wall, which is what we will want to look at. Typically, the critical case of a masonry wall like ours is going to be the moment design, as we will find the compression and shear capacities of our wall are significantly large. So for this video, we'll just look at the moment design. To make sure we can clearly see the wind force we will apply in the bending tab, we will decrease the actual compression in our, our comp down to 10 kilonewtons per meter. As the moment calculated here based on this force and the minimum eccentricity is transferred to the bending tab. Alternatively, you could just remove the eccentricity in this example, as we're not designing a wall that supports a roof or floor, although it still needs to carry its own self weight. So putting it down to 10 kilonewtons per meter in our case should be suitable. Now we can switch to the R bending tab. We can see already that we have two moments that are brought from the geometry and R comp tab, being the one for robustness and that minimum eccentricity. What we want to do now is input our own bending moment. In our case, we can take advantage of the in-cell calculation feature. And so to work out our moment, we'll need to use the bending moment formula for a can lever, being WL squared on two. We'll also need to remember that our 0.68 kPa wind pressure needs to have its shape factor applied. The shape factor for a freestanding wall can be obtained from the hoardings module. And if we were to enter the dimension of our wall, we would arrive at a CPN of 1.21. So in our moment cell, we'll put 0.68 times 1.21 for our wind load, multiplied by the height of the wall to the power of two, divided by two. Note that this moment is per meter length of wall, and so we won't include the length of the wall in our formula. This gives us a moment of 2.37 kilonewton meter per meter, which is well within the capacity of our wall. To make sure it's clear what we've done, we can also add a note to the moment input of 0.68 times 1.21 times 2.4 pair of 2, 12 by 2. And we'll resize it. As we discussed earlier, we do have the ductility warning. So at this point, we can just turn it off. Note that we sometimes also get an error when reinforcing a wall for bending, where we do not have sufficient compression steel to use the reinforced compression calculations in the standard, as we can see by the error at the top here. In these situations, the capacity for the reinforced compression reverts to the unreinforced capacity, which given what our wall is going to be used for isn't going to be a problem. What we could do now is optimize the reinforcement, but we'll just leave our reinforcement as it is. If we really wanted to, we could probably bring the space into 800 millimeters, as this does not exceed the effective compression per bar in clause 8.6i. If we were using block work, then you may like to ensure you have at least one bar per block, being 400 mm centers. Other options for optimizations could be changing the masonry unit type to a hollow block, or narrowing the wall, providing the cover requirements permitted. There will need to be careful consideration of how practical certain cavity thicknesses are, however. The next part of our design is our footing, which we will want to check against overturning. So to do this, we'll open up an eccentric pad module. The inputs for this module are fairly straightforward. We have our footing geometry, our bearing pressure, and our method for bearing pressure, which we'll talk more about shortly. Below this, we then have our loads, which we'll look at later. As we discussed earlier, our wall is going to be on a boundary, and for the purpose of this module, we will assume it's on the right side of the diagram, and so we will position our wall load in relation to that. For our width, we'll put a tentative 500 millimeters. Our length will be one meter, as we'll put in our forces per one meter length, and our depth will be 500, as we discussed at the start of the video. Finally, we'll have our bearing pressure of 150 kPa. So the first thing this module checks is the bearing capacity against the applied load. For this bearing capacity, there are two methods to choose from, being elastic or plastic. The elastic method applies equations by Hosking. This method determines maximum and minimum bearing pressures of an eccentrically loaded pad footing based on the idea that all of the soil under the footing is only under pressure when the applied load's eccentricity is within a sixth of the width of the footing. There are then two sets of different equations used based on this idea. Note that our example is a case of single direction eccentricity. You can use this module to verify in two directions of eccentricity. However, you must ensure that both directions are inside the kern. Otherwise, you'll need to consider using tie beams to do this. 
The second method, being the plastic method, takes the calculated eccentricity of the loads and assumes that the load is distributed over an area that sets the point of eccentricity at the centre of this area. An example of where this might be applicable is when designing a footing under a wall on a boundary for vertical load. In this example, the wall might be offset 50mm from the boundary and be a 180mm thick fire rated precast wall. To then have a footing central under this wall, it can then only be 50 plus 180 plus 50 which is 280 millimeters wide. Although as a design this footing may work, it is unconventionally small and impractical. What could then be done is the footing is widened to an overall width of say 450 millimeters. But this would then make the footing eccentrically loaded. Using the Hoskin method, being the elastic option of the eccentric pad module, we might find the footing no longer works under bearing. And so effectively by widening the pad, we have made it fail. By applying the plastic method in this scenario, we can idealize the footing back into a non-eccentrically loaded footing and prove that it works under bearing. For our example, we'll keep our method as elastic. The next check that is done is for stability. The overturning stability is based on overturning and restoring moments calculated from the bottom corners of the pad. We'll see more details on this in the stability tab. So what we want to do now is input our loads. The way this table works is we would separate our loads into the different load types and positions row by row. In our case we'll have one for dead load and wind load. Noting that the wind uses ultimate so we must divide by 1.5 to get these back to working loads. The section on the left is for loads in the direction of the width of the footing and the right section is for loads in the direction of the length. All our loads will be on the left section. The first load we'll want to put in is the dead load due to our wall. As this wall is on a site boundary, it will be positioned at the far right edge of the footing, and hence will create an eccentric point load. Our wall will have a density of about 20 kN per meters cubed, and so our load will be 20 times 2.4 times 0.3 meters wide, giving us 14.4 kN per meter. As for our eccentricity, we will want to look at the critical case of the wind blowing towards the boundary, to the right in our case. And so our eccentricity will be 150 millimeters from the far right edge, being half the wall thickness. You can see that if the wind was blowing from the boundary direction, then the lever arm to the wall will be longer and provide a larger restoring force. As we don't know yet how wide our footing will be, we can actually use the footing width variable to automatically calculate our eccentricity each time we change the footing width. To do this, we'll input our eccentricity as equals then we'll click on the width variable to reference it. We'll divide it by two and then minus off half the wall, mean 150. If we click on it again, we can see that the W variable is in there. And if we were to change our width of our footing to say 600, we can see that our eccentricity input has changed with it. Another way to input a variable within a document is to right click the cell and click on the cell name option, which will copy it to the clipboard allowing you to paste it in into any relevant inputs. One thing to remember with this feature is that you can only reference things within the same document. So I can't take this variable to another design and reference it in. As our load is a dead load, we'll leave the type as dead load to the right. The next load we will input is our wind moment and horizontal force. The easiest way to do this is just to go back to our masonry wall and copy our formula from the cell. Can then put it into our second row and also remember to divide it by 1.5 to get it back to working loads. We'll then want to put this into our horizontal force, but convert it into just a point load by getting rid of the moment component of the equation. And dividing by 1.5. We'll also make sure we have the same eccentricity from above for this row. And so we can copy the formula and paste it in. Next to the right, we'll then specify it as a wind load. For further references on what all the types of loads are, we can look to the right over here in the notes section. Below we can also edit the combination factors as needed. With all our inputs done, we can then click the Find Critical Stability button, which finds the critical direction for stability, as this is not always obvious. We can see in our case that the dimensions of the pad we have input work fine for both overturning and bearing. To see how stability works in more detail, we can click on the Stability tab below. In this tab, we have two tables, one for stability about the x-axis and then the other about the y-axis. Each table summarizes the loads we input, being an overturning load or restoring load. 
In our case, we can see the wind loads we input causing overturning, but our wall weight causes restoring. At the bottom, we also get restoring due to the self weight of the footing. This is then summed up at the bottom to give us our utilization ratio of 0.85. For such a small footing, the strip will act as non-flexural unreinforced concrete, but for larger pads, you will need to consider the reinforcement requirements. That about covers all you need to know for designing a cantilever masonry wall and footing in Structural Toolkit. Feel free to check out our website and our other videos for more tutorials and help with using this software. If you have any questions, please contact our support team via email or by calling us. Thanks for watching. Thank you.